Back in um, the fall of 2012, uh, we were having dinner with um, friends, and they happened to be also business school professors, and we were actually talking and contemplating why the economy was not recovering. Now, when you consider that we all come from a train in economics, and we have no answer for that question, it's quite disarming. You ask yourself the question, why can we not figure this out? And the answer to this is that because somehow we've been trained to think about the same old story, and the story is somehow the one related to growth. We are indeed obsessed with growth. Our entire economy are designed about growth. Our entire economic policy is designed around growth. And we get extremely happy when we get marginal growth. So if you have a country saying that their GDP will grow by 1.2% or 2%, we have reasons to celebrate. If a company says that their projected sales next year will be a compound of 3%, this actually company will imagine that this is actually something to embrace because it means we are in good standing. But where is this obsession of growth coming from? Well, it's not historical. It would actually be interesting to think that we have always been the case. But when we actually go into the numbers, we run it, uh, and this is actually the most uh, up-to-date information we could find about historical GDP. We weren't really aggregating that much. For most of history, we were not really too worried about growth. We had a much more distributed system. It was definitely a lack of structure but we were not creating this compound elements that creates growth in the first place. So we were extremely busy in living a life, not necessarily in building a life that could be measured at the aggregate. So what does it mean? Look at the difference between growth before and growth now. They're uncomparable. Anyone that tells me that I can learn from the past the lesson of what occurred to try to project them into the future, is somehow statistically wrong. You can't compare something that has an entirely different composition in the first place. You can't compare the GDP of the world for historical reasons up to the 1900 with what we actually did right now. Yes, the Industrial Revolution has changed everything, but it also changed the fact that it spoiled us and it really limited us to think about growth only in one dimension, the one that we can measure at the aggregate level. To tell you in a different sense is when we can actually measure at the macro level, the growth happens. So most of our system, our social economic context, our social welfare is driven primarily with the assumption that growth has to happen. And that assumption has become obsessive for most of us. But in recessive time, when everybody's asking the same question, where is growth? Of course, we can't find the answer because if the only way we have to define growth is at the aggregate level, and the aggregate at the macro level is somehow decreasing its volume, when we'll find always very micro percentage of growth. So we were frustrated, and we decided, what if it's the way we're asking the question that is wrong in the first place? We're expecting growth to happen at the macro level, but what if growth is actually not at the macro level, but a much lower level, the grassroots growth, as we call it? So we started to think maybe there are forces right now in the 21st century who are changing dramatically the way society operates. You see, in an industrial model where the society is driven by the production, clearly growth can only grow or degrow, but it's something that will happen on a proportional level and sometimes incremental. But in a world in which so many large-scale forces are shaping everything we do, Clearly, growth can not only be found at the top, it can also be found somewhere else. So we started a really exciting experiment. We flipped the question. What if growth is to be found at the micro level, not macro? And can we find any evidence of this? So we started with um, a large question mark that was actually puzzling our minds, and we actually ran pilots. The interesting part about the story I'm about to tell you is that we ran pilots since 2013. We've been doing this now for almost four years, and it's been fascinating to discover that all of the training we got in economics were actually wrong. Yes, I said it. As an economist, I can tell you right now, everything I learned in school was formally correct, but in a, from a practice perspective, it's not helping me to find any growth right now. Why? If growth is shifting from macro to micro, it's become unnoticed from most of our macroeconomic instruments. So it, this is why sometimes we are forcing the process to give us a sense of growth when actually it's only marginal growth. It's not real growth. But when we started this inquiry and we started to walk around, we were really noticing that, yes, our current models are not designed to allow us to find the growth. So what can we do? We started to imagine what if we could have proxies that help us to define growth in a different way. 
Now most of the growth is happening in elements that we can measure after they happen, but we hardly have a way to measure it while it's happening. So we decided to go old school and go into observation. So we thought, what if we observe something that is changing our normal perception of reality? The first thing that happened is that in 2012-13, quinoa was rising in our diets. And we started saying, hold on a second, what if I'm asking the question in a different way? Is quinoa a market that's now actually rising? But because it hasn't aggregated yet, I can't measure it. So we actually ran the numbers, and we discovered that quinoa, pr produced primarily in Bolivia at the time, was ri rising at 25% per year. Now, for all of you, a 25% growth is exceptional for most business or country. There's no country that ever reached that. So imagine what it means for a business to actually grow at 25%. So we said, well, maybe this was a lucky shot. We have more work to be done. We have to discover whether this is actually the case in a systematic manner. So we continued to run. We ran 40 pilots around the world. We had a little bit of a grant from a consulting firm who said, go out there and tell me what you find. And we discovered so many different things. To put it in a perspective of what we discovered, we discovered that when these large-scale forces are shaping our environments, they're also allowing social phenomena to really appear. So most of this market don't happen because we have large capital moving in. They happen because how people are. And we call this the dormant demands. These are demands that are in the market out there. They're ready to be activated, but they tend to be invisible to most of us. Why? Because our instruments are not calibrated to measure them. They're calibrated to measure somewhere else. A perfect example I'm always making when I'm teaching this in the classroom is always to say, it's like having a torch. If you're pointing to the sky, you'll never see what's actually right there at your grassroots, right? At your grassroots level. It's the same principle. How do we think about growth, not from a perspective of macro, but from a perspective of micro? So over time, we, because uh, we are academics, so we have to justify ourselves that we are important. Um, as only justification, we're not important. We decided to develop a framework. Uh, the framework was called DRIVE, and it's a framework that we still use today to detect these large-scale forces. We then talked about the fastest spending market, the macro. Then we developed the proxies. We decided to go into pain points, field witnesses, and certain futures. It's a way for us to think about that there are ways, like a GPS system, that help us to find our way through this entirely new formulated question. And as we were doing this, we discovered fantastic stories. First of all, we discovered that, yes, our hypothesis was correct. If you are reversing the question, and you're not searching for growth macro, but you're going micro, you find plenty of this. Now, most of this growth will never follow a traditional trajectory. It will never follow the trajectory that most economies expect to follow. Therefore, most of the time, they remain very idiosyncratic, very much on the ground. They hardly become more than what they are. But if we could discover them, how would our economic policy, our social policy, and our, our economic opportunity really change? We discovered that what is magical about this dormant demand is that when we activate the demand with a business model, you can actually really spin off. You can create spillover effect. You can create market out of market. And all of this never really go or ascend to the financial economy. It always stays at the real economy. Guess what? The real economy needs to grow now more than ever because the tendency is for most of our capital to be created by the real economy and transfer over the financial economy. I'm going to give you numbers. The real economy, which is all of you, every day when you go to work, when you're sending your kids to school, when you're basically engaging into a new effort, when you go into a new degree, when you are showing up in a classroom and meeting your students, when you're driving, when you're buying a property, everything you do every day defines the real economy. And this real economy is accounted for about 60 trillions right now. So it's 99.9% .9 of all of us. And the financial economy is 300 trillions. Now, interesting, the financial economy is only a micro proportion of the entire economy. We can argue that the financial economy counts for now 15% versus 85% of the economy that is powered by people like us. So why do we still have this imbalance between macro and micro? Primarily because we are empowering the macro to be the only way of defining engaged growth. So the way i like to share with you some story with you is that what we discovered was phenomenal. We discovered growth everywhere. We discovered growth in Bolivia, as I mentioned before, rising at 25%. We then discovered growth in Spain. It was the time where Spain was struggling because of the real estate bubble, because the banks were actually being restructured and consolidated, 
And it wasn't easy for a Spaniard to think there was actually a brighter future. And guess where we found growth in organic production of agriculture, growing at 430% per year. Now, if I even tell you 400% growth is exponential by the way I'm sharing this with you, and it means that growth is everywhere, if we are able to tap into this growth, happening through the social drivers that really happen primarily by habits, trends, or the way people simply are. To share with you some of the story, chia seeds is another one that really completely fascinated us. We discovered that chia is rising every, every year by 1,000% growth. And who can imagine, this is a millennial food. This is a food that happened to be part of the diet of Latin America for so long. And when it was discovered as being an integrator of healthy food, suddenly grew rapidly. So anyone that has an agricultural activity around chia right now is enjoying a lot of the growth of 1,000%. Which financial market give you growth of 1,000% per year? None of them. Why? Because if we're observing the macro, we hardly know this was happening in the background, which is where we actually really are. From Chia, we decided to go in a different part. So Chia was discovered primarily in the US, but this connected to the production of food in, uh, of course, in Latin America. Then we started noticing, and the story is that I was uh, teaching in the San Francisco campus, and I noticed that there was Il Fornaio, uh, which is a beautiful uh, bakery and pizza place, and now they have a food truck. So I noticed the food trucks in America have been rising exponentially since I was a kid and I was spending time between Canada and the United States. Now, food truck, three Americans out of 10 every week goes twice to a food truck. Now, this is unprecedented. We used to have this food truck, but they tend to be low, low level, so it was actually street food. Now, food trucks are becoming a trend. In some place, places, you have lines for people that really want to go to a food truck because it's considered to be the place to be. Now, this is growing right now at 30% per year, powered primarily from restaurants that figure out that if I can have people coming to me, I can bring the food to them. And from there, we also discover the next one, which is Peak Gain. This is a company out of Turkey that decided to take some of the crumbs from a production of a German company who was producing video games. But they figure out that in the Middle East, there is too much over stereotyping of the Western type of characters in the game and very little about the Eastern type. And so what they did, they designed video games differently that are actually really characterizing the cart of the game, looking much closer to uh, another part of the world. Now, Peak Game, which is a small startup, is currently growing at 25.6% growth. Throughout the time of the beginning to the end when we studied them, they had an accrued growth of 225%. And this happened because they understood at the social level there was a need for a different level of demand. And this was a dormant demand that was activated with a business model. The final example I want to share with you is the one that we still teach in class that we, is fascinating many of us and is really applicable across the globe. This is what happened with M-Pesa in Kenya. Now, Kenya is not a country you would expect that will have a growth of 172% in banking. And yes, they had the growth of 172% in banking because we have bypassed the banks and we allowed millions of people to have access to a bank account without having a bank account. Isn't that smart? What was the demand? millions of people that were never qualifying to have a bank account. And now we're going to give them an option through a mobile application to have a bank account. And PESA has transformed everything. It's one of the examples that we can use multi with multipolarity. On one hand, it has changed a lot the way we think about banking. It has created a space for fintech to go in that direction. It allows uh, many people to think that being digitally, um, digitally present and having a literacy in finance so does not have to require a degree. And he has really taught us a lesson that if you are not able to participate at the aggregate level, you can still find a way to participate at the micro level and find growth with this. My takeaway for you as we're trying to move towards the end of this conversation is really to say where are the large scale events that are shaping your reality right now? How do I recognize them that matters to me? How do I understand that while in the past, inside out was the way strategy was speaking, outside in now is shaping a much greater deal of the type of society we're going to have? In which way can we think about those trends being applicable to us? How do I discover proxies that will allow me to navigate through the complexity? So I can say, yes, this matters to me because I'm a food company and maybe waters matters to me. And now I know that a specific problem might become a demand in the making and I will be able to recognize that my action ability doesn't stay at the aggregate level,
but it stays at the micro one. How do we empower this grassroots movement to be part of a growth model? How do we change the equation? How do we teach our students in economics? The growth hardly can be found at the macro level. It has to be found where people really are. And now do we understand that by bringing entrepreneurship and business model innovation is where we're going to tap growth. You see, guys, what I learned is that it's not true that we are in a low growth period. We are in a low growth period according to the 20th century jargon. But according to the 21st century jargon, we're still prospering. We're just prospering in a way that hasn't been measured yet. So my invite for you, as you're thinking about this conversation, is find where is the dormant demand around you, activate it, talk about this, make sure capital can go there, and we actually won't be able to be obsessed with growth in the same way. We'll perceive growth as being a normal process of our human life. Thank you very much. Yeah.